it's, first of all, it's interesting to hear my life flash before my eyes like that. I've had several. And it's delightful to see so many friends, former students, parents of current students. It's um, the best kind of town Cincinnati is, and it's really a lot of fun. I'm going to talk fast. I want to warn you. Uh, I've arbitrarily chosen what I'm calling the top 10 for 2012. And this is an interesting time slot because it was an entire period in which the court, three justices of whom are now gone, were together. So in other words, starting January 1, 2013, we have a whole new ball game. And this one ends before Justices uh, French, O'Neill, and Kennedy joined the court. My selection is completely arbitrary, and so there's a potpourri, which hopefully will find something that interests uh, you for, for among these. I'm starting out with a juvenile case, which many of you may know very little about, but it's kind of a juvenile constitutional case, raising some very interesting issues. The case is in race CP. 15-year-old CP was adjudicated delinquent as a result of several serious sex offenses he committed. He was also designated a serious youthful offender in regard to each offense. Now, 2152.86 creates a new classification, which is really a mouthful. It's called Public Registry Qualified Juvenile Offender Registrants, which we are going to call PRQJORs, hopefully, simpler. That status is imposed on anyone between 14 and 17, a juvenile, when the offense was committed and involved victims under 12 or certain other major felonies. Now, the juvenile judge did classify CP as a PRQJOR, and by statute, that automatically made him a Tier 3 sex offender, child victim offender, which requires mandatory reporting and notification. PRQJORs have to comply with all the reporting and notification requirements for Tier 3 adult sex offenders set forth in Chapter 2950. This is all part of the Adam Walsh statute. Um, that statute for juveniles imposes lifetime registration and community notification requirements, including placement of all kinds of personal information on a public internet registry. PRQJORs receive no reclassification hearing upon completion of their juvenile disposition. So they become eligible for reclassification 25 years after their statutory registration obligations start. The 4th District Court of Appeals upheld CP's classification as a Tier 3 sex offender and as a PRQJOR. Now, CP argued to the Supreme Court that these automatic classification, registration, and notification requirements violate due process, equal protection, and the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. The Supreme Court of Ohio found that the statute did violate due process and particularly the ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Justice Piper wrote the opinion for the majority. I don't say that often. Those of you who are court watchers know he's often dissents. Wrote the majority decision. Some years back, in a case called State versus Williams, which involved an adult sex offender, the court had previously held that the registration and notification requirements in Chapter 2950 are punitive, not civil in nature. So that issue was not challenged again, although the dissenters reaffirmed their disagreement with that holding. The majority in the CP case actually relied heavily on two US Supreme Court decisions which have banned certain kinds of punishments for juvenile offenders. Roper versus Simmons, which has banned the death penalty for juveniles who committed their offenses before the age of 18. And Graham versus Florida, which held that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the imposition of a sentence of life without the possibility of parole on a juvenile offender who has not committed a homicide offense. So the majority in Ohio, the decision to strike down 2152.86 was analyzed and based on a number of factors carefully set forth by Justice Piper. First on the list was a lack of a national consensus favoring the publication of personal information. Ohio was the first state to pass an Adam Walsh Act. Congress threatened states that didn't comply with crime control funding cutoffs. And Justice Piper found that Ohio instituted a system that most of the rest of the country later rejected and was completely out of sync with the current views on the treatment of juvenile sex offenders. Other factors the majority cited were its belief that juvenile offenders are less culpable, more likely to change than adult offenders, and the special harshness of any kind of lifetime registration and notification requirements for a juvenile. 
Justice Piper described the latter as forcing a juvenile to wear a statutorily imposed scarlet letter as he embarks upon his adult life. Additionally, the majority found that those lifetime registration and notification provisions directly conflict with the fundamental purpose of juvenile law, which is rehabilitation. So the majority found that the registration and notification requirements violated the Ohio Constitution's ban on cruel and unusual punishment, which is found in Article 1, Section 9. Now, acknowledging that cases involving cruel and unusual punishment under the state constitution are rare, all those of you who have followed the court know that Justice Piper has been a leader in finding greater protection under the state constitution and exists under the federal, under the doctrine of new judicial federalism, so this wasn't totally surprising, at least to me. Um, but the court found that the key factor was a lack of proportionality in finding this statute unconstitutional. And especially significant also were the complete lack of any discretion in the juvenile judge over the portion of a penalty that could last an entire lifetime and the very public nature of a punishment that runs counter to the confidentiality of the juvenile justice system and its rehabilitative goals. So the court found that 2152.86 violates a juvenile's right to due process under the federal and state constitutions because of the elimination of all discretion of the juvenile judge at the most consequential phase of the process. Justices O'Donnell and Cup wrote very, very heated dissents in this case. Justice O'Donnell went into specific, very graphic details about CP sex offenses, not just in this case, but in several others while he lived in Utah. His distaste for the conduct of this particular juvenile is quite palpable in this decision. And unlike the majority, he does not believe that registration and notification are punitive. He's always taken the position they're civil, but he goes by the court's precedent on this point, and so he couldn't go counter to that. That ship has sailed, in short. He also criticized the majority for substituting its judgment for that of the General Assembly. It's a very common complaint or common uh, observation from him. And sees due process violation. He didn't see any because he finds discretion as a matter of grace and not of right. Justice Cupp was indignant that the majority would even compare the punishment in this case with the punishment in Graham, which was lifetime imprisonment with no chance of parole. I'm left wondering how the two can possibly be considered comparable for constitutional purposes, he wrote. I don't find the, the requirements at issue here pertaining to registration and notification to rise to such a level to be even remotely comparable. He would find that the statute does provide adequate procedural safeguards and does satisfy due process. He thinks the majority will create the proverbial Pandora's box of unanswered questions for juvenile judges. Now, one last thing. In June of 2012, after this decision came out, the U.S. Supreme Court continued its trend mandating less severe treatment for juvenile offenders, holding that states cannot impose a mandatory life sentence with no possibility of parole <coughs> on juvenile offenders, even those that commit homicide offenses. So extending the precedent a little farther, that decision was in the companion cases of Miller versus Alabama and Jackson versus Hobbs. Okay. The next case up had got the most hits on my blog. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention www.legallyspeakingohio.com, blogging on the Ohio Supreme Court. <laughs> Please feel free to sign on in any number of ways that you can. This case, as I said, has got a tremendous number of hits. In 2006, Dwayne and Julie Schwartzwald bought a house in Xenia, Ohio. They received a loan from Legacy Mortgage to pay for the house, and they gave the note and mortgage to Legacy to secure the loan, very standard deal there. Legacy contracted with Wells Fargo to be the loan servicer, and later endorsed the note to Wells Fargo, and later assigned the mortgage to it. In 2008, Schwarzwald lost his job, and the Schwarzwalds could not make their mortgage payments. On April 15, 2009, Freddie Mac, the plaintiff in this case, initiated a foreclosure action against the Schwartzwalds for defaulting on their loans. So far, a very, very, very common fact pattern. However, the paperwork when the complaint was filed by Freddie Mac was a complete mess. At the time of the filing, it owned neither the note nor the mortgage. By the time a judgment was entered, it had cleaned all that up, and it did properly hold both. So notwithstanding this, the trial court granted summary judgment to Freddie Mac finding that the Schwartzwalds had defaulted on the loan and Freddie Mac bought the property at sheriff's sale. The Second District Court of Appeals affirmed finding that lack of standing can be cured 
with the proper paperwork prior to entry of judgment, and that was the issue on the appeal. The Schwartzwalds argued that standing has to be determined at the time the action is filed. Since Freddie Mac hadn't obtained the note and mortgage until after it filed suit, it lacked standing to bring the foreclosure action. And they also argued that real party and interest and standing are not the same. Freddie Mac conceded that it was not entitled to enforce the note when it filed the complaint, but it argued it was entitled before judgment, and so that that cured the problem. It argued it was entitled to enforce the note as a non-holder in possession of the instrument with rights of a holder, and that the failure to be a real party and interest at the time of filing the suit can be cured by Civil Rule 17a and was so cured by the assignment of the note and mortgage prior to the judgment. The court sided with the Schwartzwalds, the homeowners here. In a unanimous decision written by Justice O'Donnell, the court held that standing is jurisdictional. Because standing is necessary to invoke the jurisdiction of the common police court, it has to be determined at the time suit is filed. A plaintiff must be injured at the time suit is filed, not later. Freddie Mac had not suffered any injury at the time it filed the foreclosure action. So it had no standing to invoke the jurisdiction of the common police court. Very basic stuff here. And the court also held that the real party and interest rule will not cure a lack of standing. In 1988, some language in a case called State X. Rel. Jones v. Suster kind of suggested that it could, but that the portion of the opinion stating lack of standing can be cured by substituting the proper party so that a court otherwise having subject matter jurisdiction may proceed um, was just a plurality opinion. Justice O'Donnell disclaims that case, said there was no majority on that point and therefore, it was not a holding of the court, meaning, yeah, you can make the substitution before judgment. That's disclaimed in this case. O'Donnell noted that Civil Rule 17 allows fiduciaries to file suit in their representative capacities on behalf of real parties and interests. But the rule does not allow a party with no stake in the controversy to file a claim on behalf of a third party, then obtain the cause of action by assignment, and then have the assignment relate back to the commencement of the action which is pretty much what Freddie Mac had argued in this case. Now, if you ask me what happens to the property in this case, I have no idea. It's a very good question, as I like to tell my It's a good question. OK. Um, at oral argument, though, I mean, I think this case has a tremendous amount of social significance. Justice McGee Brown made a number of comments at oral argument that were quite interesting. And in one, she asked Freddie Mac's lawyer, What's your hurry, counselor? Are you afraid the house is going to get up and walk away? She said quite pointedly. And she also said this. She said, why should the court find a more relaxed rule for Freddie Mac than Freddie Mac would otherwise give to its customers? And that sort of summed it up, I think, in terms of the court's attitude in this case. OK. The next case, actually, I think is the most interesting case of the year. And it was a singer. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know. No, I guess it was Boris that had some involvement in the case. American Chemical Society versus Levsko. This one is kind of a long wind up. All right, it's also kind of a David and Goliath type of case. Generated a lot, a lot of interest, both from lawyers and from the American Chemical Society. First, I'm gonna tell you who the players are. ACS, the American Chemical Society, is the world's largest scientific society with over 164,000 members. It describes itself as one of the world's leading sources of authoritative scientific information. It's chartered by the US Congress, and it has 1,900 employees. The largest division of ACS is Chemical Abstract Service, located in Columbus, Ohio. Chemical Abstracts produces comprehensive databases of chemical information that are accessed by scientists and researchers. And so the long saga of this case actually began when three chemical abstract scientists began working on a software tool known as Pathfinder that was supposed to make it easier for researchers to access and organize all of the information in ACS's databases. But chemical abstracts stopped work on Pathfinder to the disappointment of those three scientists, so they left and formed their own company called LedScope to develop their own software product. And LedScope applied for and received a patent for its work. So now comes the falling out. Robert Massey was the president of Chemical Abstracts, and he reported to the executive director of ACS. 
Massey got worried that the departing scientists might have appropriated his company's intellectual property. So ACS demanded that Let's Go pay a million dollars immediately and hand over the patent. Now, Let's Go was operating on a shoestring, and this just didn't happen. So ACS filed a suit in federal court against Let's Go and against the three scientists personally. The day the lawsuit was filed, two ACS managers circulated an internal memo, and they used to, this is sort of a cautionary tale because part of this case is a defamation claim against the law firm that was representing the, the company in this case. So the day the lawsuit was filed, two managers circulated an internal memo to all ACS staff about the lawsuit. The memo stated that the ACS was acting to protect its intellectual property and proprietary information, and the memo advised staff members not to comment on the matter. Ten days later, the Columbus Business First newspaper published an article about the lawsuit. ACS's outside counsel said that in this in the article. Our motivation in filing the suit is to acquire back the protected information that they took from us. Okay, that's going to form the basis of the defamation claim. Bad comment. Let's go people responded that the lawsuit had no merit and that the timing was suspect. Okay, so now ACS dismissed the federal court case, refiled it in the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. And pertinent to this appeal are ACS's claim for a misappropriation of trade secrets. More importantly, Lidscope's counterclaims for unfair competition by way of malicious litigation and defamation. The Attorney General actually intervened in this case and argued there was no such tort in Ohio, but that didn't really get much traction. And so there is such a tort in Ohio, in case you were wondering. The jury found against ACS on the misappropriation of trade secrets claim in favor of Lidscope on the counterclaims for defamation and unfair competition. So Lidscope and the scientists were awarded a total of $26.5 million in compensatory and punitive damages. The trial court denied ACS's post-verdict motions. The most, pertinent, the most pertinent to this appeal was the court denied a JNOV on the unfair competition claim. The 10th District Court of Appeals affirmed the jury verdict and all the rulings on the post-verdict uh, motions absolutely across the board. So the key in this case is the jury instruction that was given on this sometimes questionable, hitherto unknown tort, unfair competition. The jury instruction that was actually given focused solely on whether ACS had brought the lawsuit in bad faith. The Court of Appeals agreed that malicious litigation can be the basis for an unfair competition claim in Ohio, and that bad faith is the proper standard to evaluate such a claim. The Supreme Court first found that to establish an unfair competition claim based on malicious litigation, a party has to show that the legal action is objectively baseless and that the opposing party had the subjective intent to injure the party's ability to be competitive. The court found here, now this is where you really got to keep your eye on the ball. The court first found the jury instructions given on that tort claim were incorrect because they didn't include the objectively baseless element. So you're going, okay, case gets reversed and remanded, to be retried under the proper jury instructions. That's what you should be thinking. That's what the three dissenters were thinking. They were thinking, what are you thinking to activist Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor? I'll tell you what she did in a minute. Remember, normally if a jury is given the wrong instruction on a key element, the case goes back and remanded for a new trial. And that's what Justice Stratton O'Donnell and Cobb said should have happened. But it is, that is not what happened. Writing for herself, Justices Lansinger and McGee Brown, that's three, Chief Justice O'Connor evaluated all of the evidence on the unfair competition by malicious litigation and decided that rather than sending the case back, Ledsco should win. Okay? Chief merciless in her evaluation of the evidence presented by ACS. Ultimately, this is what she wrote about the jury instruction on unfair competition. Although the jury's determination was made using the bad faith standard, the evidence presented was so lacking that even if the objectively baseless standard had been applied, the outcome would have been the same. We reached our determination with great respect to a jury's role in the judicial process, but we also recognize that a court of last resort may decide the merits of a case when it adopts a new legal standard. 
that result is proper here, given the nature of the claims presented and the fact that a decade has elapsed since this lawsuit was filed. When an appellate court adopts a new legal standard, on some occasions, it applies the new standard itself and decides the merits. And that is what she did. Justice Pfeiffer didn't agree with the new test for unfair competition by way of militia game. So it's three to three here, okay, if you're counting. He didn't agree with the new test, but he did agree that Letsko had proved its case for unfair competition under the new standard the court announced. And he also agreed that the Court of Appeals judgment on the unfair competition claim should be affirmed. So that's four people for keeping the verdict on the unfair competition claim, although they're not all giving the same reason. So is that judicial activism? It really makes me smile. Activism is always in the eye of the beholder, right? Okay, there's a good example of it. Fascinating case. Now, Lesko had also won a substantial amount of money on the defamation claim, but the court took that away by a vote of five to two. A majority found that those two publications that Lesko deemed to be defamatory, the internal memo, the comments in the newspaper, were not defamatory as a matter of law, says the court. The court found that read in context, the internal memo was nothing more than an explanation about the lawsuit and a directive to employees not to talk about it. And the court also found the newspaper article was a balanced presentation of the views of both sides and a true and accurate summary of the pending case. Now, in an unusual pairing, I said it was five to two, Justices Piper and Cup dissented and would have kept the defamation verdict. Justice Piper wrote some interesting things like, essentially, you're calling those people crooks, and to me, that's defamatory, something along the flavor of what he wrote. Uh, meanwhile, this case has now been settled for about $23 million. This was, I think, posted on uh, the ACS website. There were many, many, many questions about this case among the members of ACS, because I, I saw, because I got, my blog got linked to their site, and it was a very, very interesting case, to put it mildly. Okay, so now you know that there is unfair competition by way of malicious litigation, and you now know what your instruction you have best asked for when you use that tort. Okay, here's another one for corporate lovers. It's Miller versus Miller. Um, and an issue is the interpretation of Ohio's corporate advancement statute, codified at 1701.13E5. <clears throat> the facts and the procedure are super complicated, and I'm really boiling this one down here. Trumbull Industries is an Ohio corporation that sells plumbing supplies. You know, it's always these mundane beginnings, great cases. It sells plumbing supplies. Two sets of cousins own the stock. Brothers Murray and Sam H. Miller on one side, brothers Sam M. and Ken Miller on the other side. The appellees in the case are Trumbull Industries the Company, Murray and Sam H. Sam M. is the guy who you want to keep your eye on here. He's the appellant. Daniel Ums is the former president of Briggs Plumbing Products, which was one of Trumbull's suppliers. Briggs entered into a contract with Jacuzzi Inc. to sell plumbing products to Jacuzzi. Without telling the appellees, Sam M. got very involved with UMS in negotiating a more favorable contract to sell plumbing products to Jacuzzi. And Sam M. called this the brand company project. And on December 4, 2002, Sam M. sent a memorandum to Sam H. Murray and the company shareholders informing them of the brand company project. They demanded he cease and desist because they thought he was usurping a corporate opportunity he didn't cease and exist, and he continued to work with UMS on it. So, in February of 2003, Murray and Sam H., individually and as shareholders, directors, and officers of Trumbull, sued Sam M. and UMS, alleging that they had usurped a business opportunity that belonged to the company. On September, on September, um, in September of 2005, Sam M. sent a memorandum to Murray and Sam H., informing them he had reimbursed himself for his legal expenses, this is what this case is actually about, and executed what was known as an undertaking, which for those of you who practice in this field, you probably know exactly what that is, but I have never practiced in this field, and I had a little learning curve here. Um, in the undertaking, Sam M. expressly agreed that he would abide by all statutory provisions. Both sides filed for declaratory judgment on Sam's right of indemnification of attorney's fees and expenses. The trial court ordered the plaintiffs to reimburse Sam M for fees he'd already incurred and to advance payments for his ongoing expenses. 
When the company refused, the trial court held the company in contempt. The company appealed the contempt order, but the main focus of the appeal was that the trial court was incorrect in ordering them to pay and reimburse Sam M for his fees. The 11th District Court of Appeals reversed in a split decision. I'm trying to remember, Justice O'Neill might have been on this case when he was on the Court of Appeals, I'm not sure. Anyway, essentially holding that the trial court erred in ordering the corporation to reimburse Sam M for his attorney's fees because he wasn't acting in the best interest of the company. In a 6 to 1 decision authored by Chief Justice O'Connor, the Supreme Court is going to reverse the Court of Appeals and held that Sam M was entitled to the advancement of his litigation expenses. The High Court noted that in 1986, the General Assembly amended 1701.13 to provide for the advancement of expenses from a corporation to a director, and that this was its first opportunity to actually review this statute, so it decides to look to Delaware, the haven of all such things, for guidance. The court began its analysis making a very important distinction between advancement and indemnification, cautioning that though the terms were related, they weren't synonymous. It immediately corrected what had happened below because below the case was discussed as being about indemnification, and the High Court said, no, this is a case about advancement, not indemnification. Advancement occurs before the fact, indemnification occurs after the fact. The court held only Sam M's right to advancement was actually before the court. And as to that issue, the High Court first found that advancement of expenses provision is mandatory and in no way dependent on any subsequent indemnification issue. But while mandatory, it's not automatic. It's triggered upon the corporation's receipt of what is known as an undertaking. Under the pertinent statutory provisions, a director has to agree to undertake repayment of the advances if it's proven by clear and convincing evidence that the director's actions or inactions were done with deliberate intent or reckless disregard to injure the company, and the director has to agree to reasonably cooperate with the corporation in the suit or proceeding. So the court found that Sam M had done that right. He'd executed the proper undertaking, and the court rejected as unsupported by the evidence the appellee's argument that that agreement to cooperate was simply a sham. The court also held that when a director is being sued by his own company, the duty of reasonable cooperation should not require the director to surrender his right to defend himself. This latter holding was in response to a very heated dissent by Justice O'Donnell, who would have denied Sam M the right to advancement of any expenses because of the alleged breach of fiduciary duty to his own company. He wrote this, this case concerns whether a director of a closely held corporation who has fraudulently usurped a corporate opportunity for personal benefit in breach of a fiduciary duty may compel the corporation to advance expenses, including attorney fees, to defend a lawsuit brought to recover damages for that misconduct. Well, I always tell my students, all in the way you define the issue, right? Listen to it that way, you think, yeah, wow. So O'Donnell doesn't believe that the advancement statute should apply where a corporation is suing one of its own directors. He also urged the General Assembly to revisit the statute and eliminate the requirement to advance fees when the corporation is suing one of its own directors. Now, one last point here. Although advancement of a director's expenses is mandatory, a corporation can opt out of the requirement if the company's articles of incorporation specifically state that the advancement provision does not apply. But Trumbull's articles of incorporation didn't do that. So this one was a big win for the Ohio State Bar Association because it was the driving force behind the enactment of the corporate advancement statute in order to get qualified individuals to agree to serve as directors, keep corporations from leaving Ohio. This was at least the rationale at the time. So it actually filed an amicus brief and shared oral argument time in the case with Sam M. And although I generally don't like split arguments because heaven knows I watch a zillion of them now, I don't think they're effective usually. This one really was. This worked very well for the State Bar Association. Okay. So for a little change of pace, State versus Gardner. You're going to get a little criminal law here now. I'm going to, I've, I've shortened the facts in this case like dramatically just to tell you what you really need to know. After
after a period of surveillance in a high drug neighborhood and doing some record keeping, a Dayton police officer who was in patrolling an area known for frequent drug activity stopped a car at a gas station which he had been surveilling earlier for quite a number of hours. And because he, he found out there was a warrant out for the driver, an outstanding drug warrant out for the driver. So he arrested the driver and he notices a guy fidgeting in the back seat. And that guy is Damod Gardner, who's the defendant in this case. Okay, so he sees him moving around in the back seat. He asks him to get out of the car because he's concerned for his own safety. All right, so this is all standard procedure. He was concerned for his own safety. He was afraid Gardner might flee. The officer handcuffed Gardner and pats him down and found crack cocaine in Gardner's pockets. The officer informed Gardner he was under arrest and Mirandized him. Then some other officers arrived on the scene to sort of help contain the situation. Then, even later, it was learned that Gardner had an outstanding warrant for his arrest. It was a traffic warrant, okay? It's a traffic warrant. Pay attention to that warrant. Gardner was indicted for a count of possession of crack cocaine, and he moved to suppress the evidence. Instead of making a determination whether the police officer had a reasonable, articulable suspicion, whether this was a valid Terry stop, the trial court didn't do that at all. Instead, based on the judge's interpretation of an old case from the Second District Court of Appeals up in Dayton, he ruled, even if the stop and frisk was unjustified, the evidence did not have to be suppressed because the, the outstanding warrant cleansed, made good, a bad stop. Okay? Whoa. All right. So also arguing that Gardner had no expectation of privacy and the exclusionary <coughs> rule did not apply. So Gardner appealed his conviction. The Second District Court of Appeals actually reversed in a split decision and set, set the case back saying to the trial judge, please do the appropriate, you know, make the Terry's stop analysis way. But instead, the Supreme Court accepted the state's appeal in this case. And every now, I, I choose and flag certain cases for my students to watch. This is one of them, okay? This is really, it was, the argument was fascinating. The state actually argued quite heatedly that whenever a person is subject to an outstanding arrest warrant, he or she has no expectation of privacy that would protect him or her from execution of the warrant, arguing more specifically here, just what I said, that even if the detention is bad, that a arrest warrant cleanses the badness, okay? I mean, I'm sitting there with my mouth hanging. I mean, you know, I'm a civil liberty card here. I'm listening to this thing, and I can't believe my ears. But anyway, in fairness to the state, they were relying on this old case from the second district that was out there. The high court, however, not a bunch of crazed liberals when it comes to the rights of criminal defendant, rejected the state's position absolutely and completely, and with some vehemence for a unanimous court in an extremely eloquent opinion, Chief Justice O'Connor, here's some flavor, you gotta hear this. We will not condone the notion that the unlawfulness of an improper arrest or seizure always can be purged by the fortuitous subsequent discovery of an arrest warrant. As one of our federal courts succinctly stated, this argument is preposterous. The Fourth Amendment does not countenance such post hoc rationalization. Whoa. Okay, so um, this is a wonderful opinion, just sort of as a Fourth Amendment raw rod. It's really worth reading. I don't think this is by any means a win for Gardner. He won this case. The case did get sent back to apply the proper standard, the terror, whether this was a valid Terry stop. And I don't have any update on this, but I'm guessing he's going to lose that argument. Nevertheless, this for those who happen to be Fourth Amendment material folks, this is a good one to have in the repertoire. Okay. So next comes a very interesting case of Accordia versus Ohio LLC versus Fishel. I'm smiling, Sam, because the first corporation here was Frederick Rowan Company, so are you, you and I maybe the first, the only two in here who remember, because this is when, this company went through many, 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 many mergers over a period of time, and I actually was a paid consultant on this case for Accordia. So, and Accordia is an insurance company that began a long time ago in Cincinnati as the Frederick Rowan Company. 
Between 1993 and 2001, the company underwent a series of reorganizations, acquisitions, and mergers. Accordia of Ohio LLC is the current company. Each of the four defendants worked for RAL or one of the successor companies, and each one signed a non-compete agreement with the then existing company, uh, the then existing specifically named company. Otherwise, the agreements were identical. Each defendant agreed not to compete with that particular company for two years. In 2005, all four defendants left Accordia LLC and immediately went to work with its competitor, Nice Lukens. They immediately began recruiting Accordia's customers over to Nice Lukens, and within six months, they transferred about a million dollars in revenue from Accordia to Nice. So Accordia sued the employees and Nice Lukens, claiming the employees had violated their two-year non-compete agreements and would misappropriate LLC's trade secrets. After Accordia unsuccessfully appealed the denial of injunctive relief, the trial court granted summary judgment to the employees on the non-compete issues. The First District Court of Appeals affirmed, finding that although the non-compete agreements did pass to each successor company, the change in ownership actually triggered the running time, okay, triggered the running time of that particular non-compete agreement, so that by 2005, all four of them had run out. Now, on appeal to the Ohio Supreme Court, Accordia argued that non-competition agreements are assets of the constituent company that transfer automatically by operation of law by, in a statutory merger. So, they're enforceable by the surviving company according to their original terms as if the surviving company were a party to the original agreement. And Accordia also argued that every time there was a change in the form of ownership of these companies, all four defendants kept the same jobs, same place of business, serviced the same customers, performed the same duties, so their employment was continuous and was never terminated by any of these restructurings. Now, the defendants didn't disagree that the non-competes passed in the mergers and restructurings, but argued that the two-year clock started ticking as soon as each merger became effective. So employment with a particular company terminates when that company is merged out of existence. Let's see, and Joe's shaking. You're, you're getting ahead of the story, Joe. You're going to be right eventually. You're shaking your head. So by 2005, all of them were freed of the restrictions when they joined one of Accordia's competitors. Now, in a four to three decision uh, written by Justice Lanzinger, the court sided with the employees holding that the non compete agreements did transfer by operation of law pursuant to Ohio's merger statements, state statutes but that each agreement was only between the employees and the company that originally hired them. Each of the non-compete agreements provided only that the employees would avoid competition during the two years following their termination from the company as defined by their respective non-compete agreements. Thus, according to this analysis, none of the party employees have violated the non-compete agreements. Justice O'Donnell wrote a very heated dissent, joined by Justices Cobb and Stratton, so it's four to three. He would accept Accordia's argument that a non-compete is enforceable by the new entity as if it were a signatory to the old agreement, and he really criticized the majority for departing from hundred years, hundreds of years of corporate law and precedent, or maybe just 100, century-old established merger law. Justice Cobb also wrote separately, joined by Justice Stratton. While he agreed that the agreements passed by operation of law to Accordia, he thought it was still to be determined whether the non-compete agreements were enforceable post-merger. Now, that's a different body of law, determined on remand under the court's jurisprudence on reasonableness of non-competes. That's a different issue. So, it seemed that after this decision in Accordia was released, that going forward, non-competition agreements had better include and to any successors and assigns language. The, the lawyer for Accordia was giving me the same reaction as Joe, shaking his head. Does the court ever grant reconsider? He calls the court ever grant reconsideration? Yeah, every millennium or so, yeah, it does, <laughs> sure, it does. And, but you know what? They did. In this case, they not only granted reconsideration, they reversed the decision completely. So, so go figure. All right, two months later, the court does grant a motion for reconsideration in this case. Accordia and the amici led by the Ohio Chamber of Commerce argued that the court was abandoning long-standing corporate law principles, particularly that a merger is not an assignment, so successors in the science language, should not be needed in corporate contracts in order to pass in a merger, and that the surviving company is a continuation of the constituent companies in a new shell. 
The court issued its new decision October 11th, reversing the original one, and Justice Lanzinger wrote the new decision with kind of a mea culpa. I mean, I, I admire her. She, she just went right out there and said, we misinterpreted one of our old cases. What was unchanged was the original determination that under the merger statute, all the assets and property, including employment contracts and non-competition agreements, passed by operation of law to the successor company in a merger. And the court emphasized the issue in this case is a very narrow one, limited to non-compete agreements in the context of a merger. The court cautioned against trying to apply its holding more broadly, and it's kind of interesting. This case doesn't have any syllabus. Neither of the two had a syllabus, the first one or the second one. What did change, and the basis for the reversal in Accordia 1, was what Justice Lansing would call a misinterpretation of some language from a 1971 decision about the effect of a merger on the merged company. The new interpretation, and the basis for the reversal, is the holding that the absorbed company, while ceasing to exist as a separate business entity, becomes a part of the resulting company following the merger. So essentially what's going on here is the court now actually adopted verbatim, pretty much, the proposition of law suggested by Accordia in the first case, which was that a non-compete agreement is enforceable by the surviving company as if it were a party to the original agreement, as if it had stepped into the shoes of the other company. Okay. So the court didn't quite quit there, though. So now in this, Accordia 2 is a 6 to 1 decision affirming the fact that this thing did pass. Uh, by a vote of 4 to 3, though, the court sent the case back for a determination of the reasonableness of the non-compete agreements, um, which is governed by a whole different body of precedent. Covenants not to compete have to be reasonable to be enforceable, and remanding the case for a determination of the reasonableness of the covenant was Justice Cupp's position in Accordia 1. Justices O'Donnell, Stratton, and Pfeiffer voted against sending the case back for a determination of reasonableness. No, this. O'Donnell and Stratton, because they said that issue was never before the court. Pfeiffer, bless his heart, because he thinks the non-compete was an unreasonable as a matter of law, and there was no need to remand them. Okay, so there's the four to three, and um, I think that there's settlement discussions going on in this case, is about all I can say. <clears throat> okay, so a very interesting one of those situations where, yeah, they do do that once in a while. And actually, when the court sort of unleashed all of its pending cases in the month of December since we had the changeover of justice. So they, they granted reconsideration in several. You could tell they were cranking out the word too quickly, I think, at the end of the year. Okay. Okay, now for eminent domain lovers, Moore versus Middleton. The plaintiffs owned property in Monroe, Ohio, that bordered a parcel of land in Middleton. But remember, the plaintiffs do not live in Middleton. That's important. Um, the Middleton property was rezoned from low-density residential to a general industrial classification to allow a coke plant to be built on the site. According to the Moors, the zone change was not for the benefit of the public, but only to make A.K. Steele happy, A.K. Steele being probably the largest employer in Middleton. Okay, so the Moors decided to bring a declaratory judgment action um, seeking a declaration that the ordinances involved were arbitrary, capricious, and unconstitutional. They also sought a writ of mandamus to compel a taking. They wanted the, the city of Middleton to, to pay them. They said they, they, in effect, appropriated their property. So they lost both of these issues at both the trial and the appeals court. Now, at the Supreme Court, the court argued, heard two zoning cases the same day. The first one was called Clifton versus Blanchester, in which the court held that somebody who is a contiguous landowner but doesn't live within the boundaries of the political subdivision can't bring a takings action. They don't live in the political subdivision, and under Ohio law, political subdivision doesn't have the power to do an appropriation outside of its boundaries. So that case was on the books and was out for months, and I was absolutely puzzled why this case wasn't released the same day, because it appeared to be raising the same issues. But it's kind of interesting. So in this one, in this case, all seven justices did agree that the Moors did not have standing to bring a takings claim. <coughs> they relied on the Clifton case, which they had decided a few months earlier in which the justices held that a property owner whose property is outside the municipality's corporate limits 
lacks standing to bring a regulatory takings claim against the municipality. Now, in an unusual lineup in this case, in a four to three decision, that evolving activist justice, Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor wrote his majority decision here. I say this with great affection. She's been, it's been interesting to watch um, her settle into the job of Chief Justice very nicely. For herself, Justice McGee Brown, Piper and Cup, so an unusual force in there, held that while the Moors did not have standing to bring a takings claim, they did have standing to bring the declaratory judgment action challenging the constitutionality of the ordinance. Now, again, under Ohio law, a municipality has no authority to appropriate property outside its jurisdictional limits. This case couldn't and didn't change that. The majority agreed that the Moors lacked standing to compel Middleton to appropriate their property. But the majority found that as adjacent property owners, the Moors had standing to challenge the rezoning um, on constitutional grounds, and they could argue that the rezoning was not substantially related to the public health, safety, or general welfare. They could do it by filing a DAC action. They might not succeed, and the chief made that very clear, but she was willing to give them a chance to try. Justice Lansinger wrote the dissent, joined by Justices Stratton and O'Donnell. The dissenters think it is absolutely inconsistent to allow them to bring the DEC action to challenge the zoning ordinance, but not a mandamus action to compel the taking. They wouldn't allow either, clearly. Um, I cannot see how the Moors have asserted a redressable injury in order to claim a due process or equal protection violation. The ordinance is as applied to property to which they have absolutely no interest, wrote Justice Lansinger. Okay. All right, and now another criminal case, another interesting criminal case, actually. Kind of another Fourth Amendment thing here. State versus Dunn. Vandalia police officer Robert Brazil received a dispatcher's report based on a tip that a man driving a tow truck was possibly suicidal and had a gun in the truck. Brazil and some other officers found the truck driven by Dunn, pulled it over, but remember, Dunn had not violated any traffic laws whatsoever. Nothing, done nothing wrong. Now, a clearly distraught Dunn told the officers there was a loaded gun in the glove compartment. The officers confiscated the gun, and Officer Brazil took Dunn to the hospital. So all very nice police work, really, up to this point. 16 months later, the state charges Dunn with the crime of improper handling of a firearm in a motor vehicle. Dunn moves to suppress the evidence, arguing the police had no constitutional basis to make the traffic stop. Trial court denied the motion, finding the stop was a legitimate response to an emergency situation, and Dunn was convicted and sentenced to community control. The Second District Court of Appeals reversed in a split decision, and the Supreme Court accepted this appeal, and is going to adopt the dissenting judge's position here, writing for the High Court, Justice Stratton, who at oral argument in this case was absolutely, in, she was so indignant. She kept saying, this is so ironic. If the police hadn't stopped to help this man and he had killed himself, his estate would probably sue the police for not helping him. So she, that, that flavor got into her majority decision. And she wrote, such is the balancing act of Fourth Amendment law, she wrote. Okay? The court first held that this was not a Terry stop, so it wasn't governed by that body of law. Rather, it was controlled by a variation of the well-recognized exigent circumstances exception to a warrant requirement, which she is now going to rename, and I don't think this is original with her, but she's going to incorporate new nomenclature, which is now called the community caretaking slash emergency aid exception. Now, doesn't that have a much kinder, gentler feel for ignoring the Fourth Amendment than exigent circumstances? It does. She obviously really prefers that nomenclature. And she cited a number of state, an extensive number of state and federal cases, including several from the US Supreme Court, recognizing that a community caretaking emergency aid exception to the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement is necessary to allow police to respond to emergency situations where life or limb is in jeopardy. That exception was clearly applicable in this case, where the police received a dispatch that a man with a gun in his truck was suicidal. So the traffic stop was proper under that Fourth Amendment exception. The Court of Appeals decision was reversed, and Dunn's conviction was reinstated. Justice Lansinger concurred separately to express her concern with charging Dunn with a crime at all in this case. 
She wrote, what is troublesome here is the state indicted Dunn for the crime of improper handling of a firearm in a motor vehicle 16 months after the police prevented a suicide. One wonders whether it was reasonable for the state to prosecute Dunn under these circumstances after more than a year had passed. I thought good for her. Nevertheless, and this is a very interesting distinction she made here, nevertheless, a motion to suppress puts at issue the actions of the police rather than the actions of the prosecutor. So because the officers in the case acted reasonably and responsibly, I agree there was no Fourth Amendment violation and the Court of Appeals judgment should be reversed. So very interesting take by her. In his solo dissent, guess who? Justice Piper saw this case entirely differently, agreeing with the Court of Appeals majority. He thought the case had all of the indicia and earmarks of an investigative stop. Where the police stop is based entirely on an informant's call to a police dispatcher, wrote Piper, the reasonableness of the stop must be based upon the reliability of the tip that generated the, the, the uh, dispatch. Under existing Ohio law, a telephone tip by itself can create reasonable suspicion necessary to support a stop. But the state has to prove the tip has sufficient indicia of reliability. Under the court's own precedent, the bar for proving reliability is very low. Neither the informant who made the call nor the dispatcher has to testify. All that's required is the testimony of the arresting officer about the facts that brought about the dispatch. And that really isn't much. So, in this case, the state presented no evidence whatsoever, none, of the facts known to the dispatcher about the call. So to Piper, there was no way for the trial court to evaluate the reliability of the tip, which formed the entire basis for the stop and subsequent indictment. So to him, the state just failed in its burden of proof in the case. Piper also agreed that this is an exigent circumstances case by whatever name is called. He went through and distinguished each one of the cases Justice Stratton relied on for creating her community caretaking exception. And he pointed out that in none of those cases, none of them relied solely on a telephone tip and in each one, the police officer relied to some degree on their own personal observations and investigation. Okay. So two more, and I think we can get, squeeze this in within the time allotted if I continue to talk fast. Um, <laughs> Anderson versus Massillon. There were a number of sort of interesting tort cases decided, especially towards the end of the year. Uh, and I had a hard time choosing between a woman who got kicked in the head by a horse when she was trying to help the owner of the horse untrail the horse, and whether she was a spectator or not and entitled to immunity, or a kid riding a snowboard who collided with a skier. When I learned that in Ohio a snowboarder is definitionally a skier, that was very interesting to me. So I had a hard time picking. But this is a tort case that won, and it's an immunity case. And what the court's going to do is define the terms intentional, reckless, and willful. Okay, so anybody who does torts, you got a real definition here. Engine truck 214, which was a pumper truck, and engine 211, an aerial ladder truck, were dispatched in response to a citizen's report of a car fire in Massillon. When reaching the intersection where the accident occurred, engine 214 slowed down to be sure the intersection was clear before going through it. Seconds later, engine 211, which was driven by Susan Tolls, commanded by Rick Hannon, approached the intersection going, very, very fast, well in excess of the speed limit. Tolls never saw a minivan of Ronald Anderson, which had entered the intersection completely lawfully. The fire truck broadsided the van, kills Anderson and his grandson, who he was taking to like preschool, all right? So Cynthia Anderson, who's the administrator of both the states, brings a wrongful death action against Tolls and Hannon personally and the city. Each side presents accident reconstruction experts. The defendants file for summary judgment and raising sovereign immunity. Trial court grants the motion and the plaintiff appealed. The Fifth District Court of Appeals reversed, finding reasonable minds could differ about whether Tolls and Annan were reckless and thus not entitled to immunity. The appeals court also held that the wanton and reckless misconduct standard, which is in 274403A6, were functionally equivalent to the willful and wanton standards set forth in RC 2744.02B1. In other words, the standard is different for the employees than it is from the, for the political subdivision, which is really the major problem here, is really that's the problem. But in the court, the court decided to decide the issue of uh, whether the terms willful, wanton, and reckless are or are not interchangeable. 
And are they functional equivalents or are they different? In a 5 to 2 decision written by Justice O'Donnell, the court held that these terms are different. In a number of past cases, the court has defined willful and wanton and distinguished those two from the other. It's when the court started talking about these terms in sports activities, recreational activities, that things began to get muddled up. In 1990, two cases deciding the same day, Marchetti versus Kalish and Thompson versus McNeil, the latter being a golf case about whether it was reckless not to yell forward and something gets hit in the eye and that kind of thing. These are sports cases. The court held that individuals engaging in recreational or sports activities assume the ordinary risks of the activities and cannot recover unless the other participants were either reckless or acted intentionally. Then, uh, the culprit, footnote one in this decision in Thompson, the court wrote, the term reckless is often used interchangeably with willful and wanton. <coughs> Our comments regarding recklessness apply to conduct characterized as willful and wanton as well. That's where the trouble started. So um, <coughs> in the Anderson case, the court has disavowed that footnote. So any of you who are interested in tort law, you should know that. And held that the three standards are different and they are not interchangeable. The court goes and the court's going to give you definitions of all three. Willful misconduct is an intentional deviation from a clear duty or from a definite rule of conduct, a deliberate purpose not to discharge some duty necessary to safety, or purposely doing wrongful acts with knowledge of appreciation, knowledge or appreciation of the likelihood of resulting injury. Wanton misconduct is the failure to exercise any care toward those to whom a duty of care is owed in circumstances in which there's a great probability that harm will result. And reckless conduct is characterized as the conscious disregard of or indifference to a known or obvious risk of harm to another that is unreasonable under the circumstances and subsequently, subsequently excuse me, substantially greater than simple negligence conduct. So the Court of Appeals was affirmed as modified, and the case was sent back to decide this case under these new definitions. Now, Justice Lanziger, joined by Justice Piper, Justice Piper hates all sovereign immunity, so you can always find that he will take the position sort of adverse to immunity. But they dissented, and the more I think about this, I actually think Justice Lanziger is correct. She made a very, very interesting point. She agrees that these three, three things represent a continuum of behavior which in the context of the immunity statute, not necessarily for all other torts, she said it doesn't make sense in that context. The purpose of the immunity statute is to protect both political subdivisions and their employees from negligent but not worse conduct. That's the whole point. So construing the three terms that are all more blameworthy than simple negligence as functional equivalents can, it makes sense. It's consistent with the goal and purpose of sovereign immunity. She'd send the case back to the trial court just to determine whether firefighters' conduct was more than simple negligence. As I said, I thought a great deal about this, and I think it makes sense. The real problem is to amend the statutes and get the language to conform to each other, because the way they're written now, the city's liable if the firefighters are willful or wanton but not reckless. The firefighters are liable if they're wanton or reckless but not willful. That's the part that makes no sense, so it needs to be fixed. Okay, we're on our last case, Jones versus Sentex Homes. Two couples, this involves a consolidated case of two different couples um, who brought lawsuits with identical issues. We'll use Jones and Sanders are the main folks. When they moved into their house, um, they found that their electronic equipment, their phones, their computers, and their televisions did not work. Brand new house, okay? They alleged the reason was that the metal joists in the house were magnetized. Don't ask me, I've been told this is impossible. I don't know, don't ask me about this part. Okay, the contract that the plaintiff signed contained provisions that waived all warranties, express or implied, except for 116 express warranties that were, claimed, that were found in a limited home warranty booklet that Sentex Home kept in its sales office. The trial court granted summary judgment to Sentex, finding that the plaintiffs had waived all warranties, except those that were contained in the booklet, and those warranties did not cover magnetized joists. The 10th District Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the trial court and also held that a waiver of the implied duty to construct a house in a workmanlike manner was permissible as long as it was, as long as it was conspicuous, unambiguous, and fully disclosed. 
The parties didn't disagree that the purchase contracts did contain provisions that waived all the warranties except those contained in that limited warranty book. They didn't disagree about that. They did disagree about whether a builder could limit new home warranties in that way. The court said it didn't see any legal impediment to a builder doing that, but the court didn't decide the case on this basis because the court's going to find what's involved here is not a warranty. So that's how the court's going to get out of this. The point of significant disagreement in this case is whether a requirement that a home builder construct a house in a workmanlike manner, a phrase that you probably heard from your first week of law school, was that an implied warranty or was it a tort duty? And could it be waived? That's the issue in the case. Sentex argued the requirement to build a house in a workmanlike manner was an implied warranty. And while conceding there was no case directly on point, Sentex argued that Ohio law permits the waiver of implied warranties and that no case has ever held implied warranties couldn't be waived. The homeowner argued, and it was interesting, the homeowner did not argue, the, the, the lawyer I thought for Sentex did a much better, much more articulate job, but lost. So it's always interesting to see those kind of things when you watch these arguments, as you all will know too. Um, the home buyers argued that the requirement imposed a tort duty and was not waivable. And the court is going to decide so completely with the homeowners on this. The court made it absolutely clear that this is a tort duty and can't be waived. The court conceded that some of its earlier case law, the language was not as careful as it should have been, but makes it clear there's no doubt that the duty to construct a house in a workmanlike manner is a tort duty imposed by law and cannot be waived. So Justice Piper, who wrote the um, uh, who wrote for a unanimous court, Justice Cobb concurred and judge, uh, concurred in judgment only. Uh, this is what Piper said. This is tort language, pure and simple. A duty to construct houses in a workmanlike manner using ordinary care is imposed by law on all home builders. The duty does not require builders to be perfect, but it does establish a standard of care below which builders may not fall without being subject to liability, even if a contract with a buyer purports to relieve the builder of that duty. Once again, the home buyers didn't win this case, and there's no update on it. They just got the right to try to prove it. Okay, so deep breath, and I thank you for your attention very much.